guys welcome back to my channel my name is Louisa if you're new here don't forget to subscribe and if you like this video give it a thumbs up also let me know your thoughts in the comments because we are going to get into a rather strange subject so today I wanted to talk about something that the new age talks about a lot which is the concept of interdimensional realities like places where essentially spirit guides or ascended masters or whatever title they give to these entities supposedly exist and in the new age there's all of these theories about like multiple different dimensions and they usually say that if you encounter something bad it's because you were in the lower astral and that you have to resonate at a higher level, um, have a higher frequency, all this kind of thing, you know, positive thoughts, positive affirmations, as long as you're in the right headspace, then nothing bad can happen to you. And the thing is, it's very easy to think that there is no biblical answer to this question, because we're sort of talking in very um, pseudoscientific terms. <laughs> And so a lot of the new age practitioners, they say that like the Bible's answer to this is very outdated, like that the Bible doesn't have answers to this. And like people have all sorts of encounters of a supernatural kind. So people see hauntings, they experience um, different things happening in their house, or they might go on like a ghost trip, things like that. And it kind of seems like the only answers that you ever get are from people who practice like mediumship, which of course is explicitly forbidden in the Bible. And what we're going to talk about today is why it's explicitly forbidden in the Bible, because the Bible won't forbid something if it's not real, if there's no like actual possibility of doing these things. So when the Bible addresses a particular issue, it's not because it's not real, it's because it is real. And so it's usually addressing a particular subject because it's something that you need to either not do <laughs> or tread with extreme caution. So we're going to get into that today. So the first thing that we kind of need to cover is whether or not different dimensions are possible whether they are in fact real. And so for that, we're going to turn to science. Now, a lot of the interdimensional type stuff is very theoretical. And it's only through different experimentations that anyone really finds out what is out there, what is real. And so it's places like CERN that are doing that kind of work. But the problem with places like CERN is that they are kind of dabbling in the occult, which sounds really weird to say about a scientific community, which is just supposed to be like smashing particles together in order to try and find um, what the particles are made out of. So CERN originally was looking for the Higgs boson, which is a theoretical um, particle that was originally dubbed the God particle. And if you want to think of it this way, the Higgs boson is kind of like the glue that sticks everything together. And when you smash a particle, the glue disappears. So it's actually very hard to measure this particular thing because as soon as you break apart the molecule, it, uh, it's gone. So they can't measure it. But it was theorized to exist because of the absence and so that absence was notable like the the numbers didn't add up the numbers didn't add up unless this particle existed so for all intents and purposes they have actually measured the higgs boson um but that's not the end of what cern does cern has been continuing to experiment with different things and part of what they do is they create antimatter, which is also known as dark matter. And um, I don't know if you've read much about that, but essentially 
it's so volatile that one gram of dark matter is enough to create an atomic bomb. And so this stuff has been created. It's now being stored at Berkeley um, University, which is concerning. Get it? Concerning? Yeah, that was a bad trick. So CERN is creating antimatter. Uh, they have also been accidentally creating tiny black holes. They actually got sued by a couple of scientists because the scientists were like, you're essentially creating these black holes. Like, do you even know what it is that is going to happen when you do create a black hole? And um, it, was, it was allowed by the courts. The courts decided that it was an acceptable risk for CERN to create black holes because CERN argued that the black holes are so tiny that they dissipate very quickly. But on top of those things, CERN has also been trying to establish interdimensional contact. So they've been opening doorways, they've been opening interdimensional portals, and they're hoping that something will come through, and they're hoping that they are able to send something through. So. The Director of Research and Scientific Computing at CERN, Sergio Bertolucci, said in a press statement about uh, these portals that they're opening that he was quite excited about the possibilities. And what they're playing around with is such an unknown kind of factor that even <laughs> renowned atheists like Stephen Hawking basically said that they are potentially opening portals to hell. So that's a little bit of background about the official work that CERN is doing. But CERN also gets into all kinds of extracurricular activities. Not least of which, this one. Oh. What the? Yeah, so apparently mock human sacrifice and um, occult rituals in front of the Shiva statue. Now, why does CERN, a scientific facility, have a statue of a Hindu god as their main courtyard? Well, it was gifted to them from the government of India, and there are multiple different countries that contribute financially to CERN and also collaborate with the different um, scientific experiments that they're doing there. So the Hindu god Shiva is the god of sacred destruction and so it's his job to demolish the world and to do that he performs this particular dance. Now the practice of yoga is essentially all about Shiva. And it's also supposed to be a practice which separates you from your sense of self so that you can reincarnate. The idea that there is such a thing as Christian yoga is ridiculous, just in case you're wondering. By the way, if you do want to know more about that particular subject, I highly recommend this book. This is called The Second Coming of the New Age, and it's by Stephen Bankars and Josh Peck. Uh, they're also on YouTube. They have their own channels. Uh, and the foreword is by Dr. Michael Heiser, and he's an expert in ancient languages. And this is probably a really good resource to have in this day and age. So already with CERN, what we're seeing is a dedication to some kind of Hindu deity and mock occult sacrifices, playing around with interdimensional portals, creating antimatter, creating black holes. This does not sound good, but there's more. <laughs> so even though they're a scientific facility, they also house an annual artists in residence program where they essentially fund a particular art project for that year.
is kind of the world that uh, is envisaged for humanity moving forward uh, according to different organizations like CERN. But strangely enough, CERN is not the first scientific organization to dabble in the occult. NASA started out as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and it was based at the Caltech, uh, California Institute of Technology. So one of the founding members of the space program, one of the founding members of NASA, was a guy called Jack Parsons. And Jack Parsons kept some very interesting company, including uh, Alistair Crowley, who was one of the most famous occultists of the early 20th century. Alistair Crowley is kind of like, he's almost the father of Satanism. <laughs> Technically that was Anton LaVey, but uh, he based a lot of his ideas off of Crowley. Crowley referred to himself as the Beast 666 and different newspapers and publications referred to him as the wickedest man alive and he was so problematic that uh, he belonged to the Order of the Golden Dawn which was an occult organization and they found him too troublesome. They actually kicked him out. You know you got issues when other occultists can't deal with you. <laughs> So Jack Parsons was a student of Aleister Crowley and when he launched his rockets into the atmosphere he would perform a ritual which Crowley had invented called the Hymn of Pan. So this was to invoke the uh, Greek god Pan and if you know much about that particular god he's very similar to figures like Baphomet and he's also very similar to figures like Satan. Pan is like the ultimate sexual deviant and he lured people in with the pan pipes so he used music to seduce people's minds. So Parsons used rockets to invoke pan because rockets look like penises penetrating the sky and this notion of like piercing the veil uh, the veil between our dimension and other dimensions kind of comes up later on when we address the issues of what is heaven, what are the heavens, so I'll get to that shortly. But yeah, as usual, <laughs> he was just too weird for the NASA group, so they eventually kicked out Jack Parsons. But Jack Parsons was also friends with L. Ron Hubbard, and if you don't know who he is, he is the founder of Scientology. Funnily enough, Alistair Crowley thought that L. Ron Hubbard was untrustworthy. How bad do you have to be for like the wickedest man alive to think that you're worse than he is? So Crowley told Parsons not to trust L. Ron Hubbard because he had like a bad feeling about this guy and his feelings were correct. Hubbard eventually like stole all of Jack Parsons' money, stole his boat, stole his wife. He was just generally a dirtbag. But when they were still friends, they decided to do this particular ritual. And so the ritual that Parsons and Hubbard decided to do, which Crowley said was a bad idea, they were going to invoke the goddess Babylon. And if you're not familiar with that reference, it's referencing the book of Revelation and the whore of Babylon. So again it's kind of like they're trying to bring about the end of the world which is a very strange aim to have. So yeah, scientists. People who you would assume have a very rational view of the world and a very rational view of reality, they are apparently interested in all of these different deities. And they're also interested in pursuing some kind of access to other dimensions which means that they obviously think that there are other dimensions and that there is some kind of intelligence on the other side. So why would scientists be interested in something like that? Possibly because there is an element of truth to it. The very first sentence in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, says that God created the heavens 
and the earth. Heavens, plural, earth, singular. So from the get-go, this implies that there is more than one heaven. But it begs the question of how many heavens there are, how many different layers to reality can we experience? In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, it speaks of a man who was caught up to the third heaven, which is referred to as the realm of God. If there are three heavens and God is in the third one, then it means that there are two heavens below it. So we can assume that there's a kind of a layering effect. In Revelation 12, 7 to 10, it says that Satan is cast down from heaven to earth. So he doesn't exist in the same heaven which God occupies, which fits in with the description of spiritual warfare in Ephesians 2, 2, and then 6, 12, where it calls Satan the prince of the power of the air and tells church members that they wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. In Matthew 24, 35, it says that heaven and earth will pass away, but God will be forever, which implies that there is a physical heaven referred to, as well as the spiritual heavens. But the most intriguing passage of scripture is found in Daniel chapter 10, which describes an angel of God appearing in response to Daniel's prayers three weeks late. Okay, so we have the third heaven, which is where God sits, and then we have the earthly heaven, which is the sky, the physical world, the cosmos around us. So there is a second heaven in between those two. And according to the battle that the angel had to go through in order to get from God's heaven to the earthly realms, the layer in between is completely controlled by Satan. And it also seems to be a lot closer to us. There also seems to be like territorial um, demons, for want of a better word, these uh, princes. The Bible mentions princes on a few different occasions. Psalm 82 talks about the falling of the princes. Ezekiel 28, 13 to 14 talks about the invisible king of Tyre not to mention the Nephilim in Genesis 6, which were the result of copulation between sons of God and human daughters. So if there's different layers of heavens and we can kind of express them in like different dimensions. So we exist in the third dimension. We are in 3D reality. You could almost say that we're kind of four-dimensional because we also exist in time as well as space. But let's go back to Genesis. So in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created different layers of reality because in a lot of different uh, passages of the Bible, such as in Exodus, where God is talking to Moses, he says that basically if someone was to look upon God, they would die. So physical human beings can't interact directly with God because it's just too much for this kind of body. So it's kind of like a stepping down process where it goes from like the megawatts to the slightly lesser voltage and then the more bearable voltage for us. And in Genesis, it says that we're created in God's image. And the reason why we're here is as kind of caretakers for the creation. So human beings are the physical manifestations of God's layering of management for creation so that uh, things can be looked after. And then above us is supposed to be an angelic layer which we can kind of interact with, but that layer became corrupted. So if you think of Lucifer as originally being this very um, heavenly angel, he was one of the highest angels and he was one of the highest angels and he staged a rebellion against God and tried to basically take over the heavens and also take over the earth. 
So God cast him down from heaven. But of course, he's not an earthly creature, so he has to exist in some kind of angelic dimension. The second heaven, if you will. So human beings, with our physical, earthly limitations on what we can withstand in forms of, like, contact with God, we can only really make contact with this second layer of heaven. Um, prayer is supposed to be able to reach beyond that. But things like astral travel do not reach beyond that. Shamanic journeying, DMT trips, necromancy, mediumship, channeling spirit guides, none of this stuff gets beyond that second layer. And in 2 Corinthians 11.14, it does say that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. So if people are exploring all of these uh, other dimensions and opening up portals and gateways into the unknown, and the only thing that they can access is the second heaven, which is technically the the realm of Satan, then the only thing that they can encounter is demons. So even if those demons look like light beings, it's really just a trick. And there's another book that I quite highly recommend. I'll link it in the description because you can actually get a free download of it. It's called Doctrine of Demons. But the writers in that book um, also talk about how you know, if you're not operating without the Holy Spirit, then the only thing that you're going to encounter are the other guys. And that that's why uh, God sent the Holy Spirit is because it's kind of like, if you will, it's kind of like having a VPN. If you have like your own intranet with like your employer, for example, uh, they often do this in workplaces where they have a very closed intranet, no one else can access it from the outside. It's kind of like that with the Holy Spirit. So when you do dedicate your life to Jesus, when you do decide to follow him, what you get is this access to God, which is a closed network. And if we're going with the theme of like technology, it also kind of installs like antivirus, uh, anti-malware kind of software into your system so that you can uh, kick out or boot out any kind of hacking. It's quite interesting living in such a technological age because it's kind of like it's like we're able to better um, articulate how these things work in terms of you know, relating it to technology and relating it to science. And I think one of the things that I found in the past, which pretty much uh, helped me to reconcile a belief in God was actually computer programming, because uh, I used to build websites as part of my job and I used to teach coding. And when you know how complicated coding is, and how easily a web page can fail for lack of like a bracket or something, then you can understand how very complicated various different natural things like DNA are. And there's no way that stuff comes about by accident. Like random happenstance is not going to result in sophisticated design. So yeah, that's kind of how I've come to understand it. Uh, another really good resource which helped me with researching this was Derek Prince. So I will link the YouTube channel for his lectures in the description box as well, as well as a link to get uh, the book The Second Coming of the New Age. Alright guys, thanks so much for watching. Take care out there. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye.